we're going to be looking at the differences between the North and South just prior to the American Civil War. We're calling this time period Antebellum America. You see that right here. See that right there. Antebellum it means before war. So this is right before the American Civil War. So we're really looking at the time period between about 1850 and about 1860. And uh, we're looking at how those two areas of the country, North and South, really are going to be different or how they're going to be the same. We're going to be looking at a couple of different areas. Uh, we're going to start first with industry. Now, I cannot make this come in point by point like I normally would if we were in the classroom. But um, you kind of have all the information at once. So uh, look at that north and south and in industrialization. First of all, the north is very industrialized. What that means is we are using machines in the north to take the place of skilled hand labor and use mass production of goods. So we're making a lot of product by a machine. There's no hand labor involved. That means prices are cheaper. It, goods are plentiful. And this is going to be a really important piece. And industrialization is actually going to affect the country from everything from agriculture to travel, communication, you name it. Uh, by about 1860, the North had 110,000 factories. That's 110,000 factories, and they produced a huge variety of goods that were then shipped all over the nation and for export. The South was not. Uh, they had very few factories. It says 118,000. It should only be 18,000. Get rid of that one right there. 18,000 factories. So a significant chunk was that a fifth less um, or they only have one fifth of the industry that the north does manufacturing in the south was limited to only very crucial uh, things like uh, ironworks maybe making cotton gins things like that there were very few uh, factories making clothes for example or something like that it was just crucial heavy industry Instead, in the South, uh, land ownership and cash crop production, slavery forms the basis of the South, uh, the South's economy. So if you're in the South, uh, your, your economy is driven by owning land. It is driven by producing cash crops and by buying, selling, and utilizing slave labor. What this also means for the South is they are going to have to get goods from somewhere else, either import them from Europe or from the North, either way. Uh, also, agriculture. It's a typical misconception. The North had the industry. The South had the agriculture. And that's a broad statement because both used agriculture a lot. The North is going to concentrate on their agriculture from the standpoint of crop pr production. Uh, this, they're going to use those technological inventions, steel plow, mechanical reaper. They are producing a surplus of crops. This is more than they can themselves can consume. And uh, what that then means is they're going to take that surplus, they're going to be able to sell it on the market, and this is going to give them profits. This is going to help feed the workers that are in the crowded cities, working in those factories we just talked about. Uh, so the North is producing a lot of food crops that feeds themselves and feeds the people in the city making other products. In the South, Southern farms, much more concerned with cash crops. If you remember way back, we talked about Jamestown and cash crop production. Cash crops are those goods that are usually luxury goods. You don't have to have them, but you want them. They're nice. And uh, we have a couple of cash crops here that are really important. Tobacco was the first cash crop, and it's going to remain important for quite a while. Cotton, of course, is going to be a huge cash crop at this period of time, this 1850 to 1860 period, as will rice and indigo and sugarcane and hemp. These are the kind of the big, um, what, six or so cash crops that existed. The problem with cash crops is that they are labor intensive. They're hard to grow. It requires a huge labor force to produce just an average product. 
And this is where slavery begins to enter the, uh, the equation. They use slave labor to make these cash crops. Now, the South also had food crops, but each area was relatively self-sufficient. They were growing just enough for themselves to consume. They were not growing a surplus, which they could then sell. Moving on from the economy, let's look at immigration for a moment. North, by 1840, has huge immigration rates. America has become a very um, desirous uh, place for people to immigrate to. And uh, we have several large immigrant groups who have decided to come to America by this point in time. The Irish are by far the largest by 1860. The Irish have come uh, for a variety of reasons, but they are incredibly poor. They settle in the slums. This is uh, the, the poorest areas possible in the major cities. They are your factory workers. They're the ones pulling the levers, pushing the buttons, uh, pushing carts of finished product around a major factory. Then you have the Germans, this last piece here. Uh, they are more of a middle class type people. Uh, they came because of a failed revolution. The king was after them. They decide they're going to get out. Uh, they were going to bypass those cities of the Midwest. Now, of course, this is not all. There, you know, there's always exceptions. Mo many are going to settle in the Midwest. And what I mean by that is they're going to settle in Indiana and Ohio and Illinois and Missouri. They're going to start small businesses. They are going to be food crop uh, farmers. So if you remember the last slide we talked about agriculture, we have the workers making products in the factories like shirts. Okay, that could be your Irish folks. And we have Germans producing food. So if you think about it, it's a very cyclical relationship, very symbolic, where the Irish are producing finished products for Germans. Germans are producing the food so that the Irish can work in those factories. And um, that's kind of where we are on that. Now, the South. Very few available jobs, so why would immigrants come to the South? They wouldn't. So the South is going to have a very, very small percentage of immigration. Slavery has eliminated a lot of those uh, jobs that typically immigrants are going to fill. So what happens as a result of low immigration, population in the South is going to be smaller. And as well, they are not going to have big cities or as many big cities and they are going to have less contact with new ideas. So they're very much more insular. They're very much more closed off uh, from the rest of the country, the rest of the world even. And uh, we're going to see that a little bit later. Speaking of population, uh, by 1860, the North has a population of 22 million people. Very diverse because of immigration. We've got people from all over the world living in the north. We have lots of big cities. New York, of course, is the largest, followed by Boston and Philadelphia. Pittsburgh by now is a large city. New Haven, Connecticut, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis in the west. These are all large cities. They are well populated. The north is very in urbanized, so it's a very urban environment. There's lots of small farms, but the big cities are kind of a defining feature of the North. The South, on the other hand, by 1860, they only have 7 million whites with 4 million blacks. So 7 million whites to 22 million whites in the North. So, you know, just a typical uh, ratio there of, of that's one to three, roughly. There's also very little variation in the South. Uh, mostly these people are all very homogenous. They're very much the same. English and Scots-Irish background, for example. And there are few large cities in the South. In fact, uh, only Richmond, New Orleans, Memphis, Atlanta had more than 30,000 people. So to put that in perspective, Cape Girardeau has a population of around 40,000. So if you're looking to compare in the South, there were only four cities uh, that even came close to Cape Girardeau. And uh, I think that's pretty impressive. So this means that South is very rural. Now, there's lots of small towns, a couple hundred people. But by and large, the, the South is dominated by those big cash crop producing plantations. Transportation is another huge factor that differenti differentiates the North and the South. By 1860, um, 
the North has really tied themselves together. They have laid down 25,000 miles of railroad track. 22,000 of that has been laid in the North alone. So the North is really well connected. If you want to move from one town to another, uh, you can do so by rail. It's relatively inexpensive to travel. It's relatively inexpensive to ship your product. So rail really helps tie the country together. Now, the other thing that goes along with transportation, I think, always is communication. Where people travel, so do ideas. So things like, uh, you know, the train, the locomotive, uh, tr carrying people from one place to another is going to help spread ideas, bring news, as will another new invention, the telegraph, which follows that railroad line right along. Uh, news and ideas really begin to bind the country very closely together, especially in the north. They're going to be a very tight-knit group. We're going to be exposed to a lot of new ideas. In the south, which, by the way, is geographically larger, there's only 3,000 miles of railroad track. So here you have 22,000 miles in the north, 3,000 miles in the south. Okay, the north is a smaller section. South is a larger section. So right away, you can understand that the South is not that well connected. It's going to take much longer for news to travel. And uh, new ideas are going to be relatively spare, uh, scarce because of you know lack of availability, because there's not new people coming in. Plus, it takes longer for that news to travel. And this is going to make the South much more isolated. Finally, really the big, big difference between North and South is slavery. And we could talk about slavery for, for days, but uh, this is just a quick overview. By 1804, all slaves in the North have been abolished. So there is no slavery in the North. What we do have are free blacks. And you can see a number there for how many were in the North in 1860. The North did not see a need for slavery. Uh, they felt uh, it more important that other folks, immigrants, have jobs. And keep in mind, these immigrants were not paid well. They were not treated well. Uh, we're talking working 16-hour days for, for pennies a week, uh, barely enough to keep themselves and their families from starving. There's no insurance. There's no unemployment. There's no workers' compensation. If you're injured, if you get your arm sucked into a machine and it gets cut off, you're out of a job because you can't work. And uh, there's nobody going to come help you as a result for, of that. But they are free. They are not slaves. The free blacks who lived in the North, many of them were craftsmen. Uh, they had some sort of skill. Maybe they were uh, woodworkers. Maybe they were ironsmiths. Maybe they, they had some sort of talent that allowed them to be paid and paid fairly well. Now, there's a really important point here, and I think my head is probably... Um, covering that. Guys, the North wants to stop the spread of slavery. They are not for equality. They don't mind abolishing slavery for practical reasons. Many people in the North felt slavery was morally wrong, but they are not about giving slaves equal rights. So keep that in mind. They don't want slavery. They don't want uh, slavery to spread, but they're not about giving sl uh, free blacks equal rights. And in the South, of course, uh, this is the heart of the slave-owning portion of the country. In 1860, there are 4 million slaves living in the South. Uh, they're roughly a third of the population of the South. But only about 7% of whites own slaves. Typically, they are between one and three. So if you think about that, 383,000 whites owned 4 million slaves. So this tells you that there are times where slave, where people who own slaves own tremendous amounts of slaves. 20, 30, 100, 200 maybe. South also had some free blacks, and that's a very sketchy situation that we'll have to talk about another time. And slaves are going to fill the labor void in the South, and they're going to do everything uh, that a white person would do in the North. They're going to be doing field work and housework. They're going to be personal servants. They're going to work in factories that are in the South. So they are doing a wide range of different things. And the South really views slaves as a cheaper alternative to hiring laborers. 
And so for them, it is much cheaper to own a slave for life than it is to hire someone to do the work. And the other big thing here that's really important is how the South have viewed slaves. They are livestock. They are property. Okay. They do not see these people. And I say that with emphasis. They do not see these enslaved people as human. In most cases, they view them as somewhat subhuman. They are property. They are livestock only. They can be bought and sold like that. South wants slavery to spread. As America moves westward through Texas and Arizona, New Mexico to California and Colorado and everything in between, the South wants slavery to go that direction. Uh, so they can continue living their life the way they always 